Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, the ENT Resident. Now, so far, I have covered the anatomy of the larynx, pharynx, and the nose. So, what's left behind is now the anatomy of ear. Now, before I start about ear, as we all know, the ear can be divided into an external, middle, and an inner ear. So, in this video, I'll be covering about the external ear. Let's start our class now. So before I start talking about the external ear which is our topic for today, first I will be telling you how can we divide ear into different parts. So if you were to look at this picture, you can see that this is the whole structure of the ear and we divide ear into three parts, the external ear, the middle ear and the internal ear. The external ear begins here at the level of the auricle or also known as the pinna and it ends at on the medial side at the level of the tympanic membrane. So this over here is the external ear which uh, includes the auricle or the pinna, the external auditory canal and the tympanic membrane as its medial boundary. Next comes the middle ear which begins at the, uh, begins at the tympanic membrane which is its lateral boundary and continues medially containing the middle ear cleft and a couple of other structures. And lastly the internal ear is the part which contains the labyrinth. So we will be talking about the middle ear and internal ear in another class. Today in this uh, class we will be mostly talking about the structures of the external ear. So beginning with the first structure of the external ear which is the auricle or the pinna. Now as it is already evident from the picture over here the auricle or the pinna it projects at a variable angle from the side of the head and most important function of the pinna is that it helps in collecting the sound from the external environment and then it transmits this sound towards the middle ear and ultimately to reach the inner ear for the mechanism of hearing. The pinna has two surfaces, a lateral surface and a medial surface. So the surface that you see here on the picture is the lateral surface of the pinna. This lateral surface that has, as you can see from the picture over here, it has a lot of prominences and depressions, each of which has a name to it. And uh, why do we really need to know about these is the fact that the unique pattern of this is comparable to fingerprints and it can help in identification of person on the physiognomy of their auricles. So that is why this structure, knowing the structure, knowing the different parts of the lateral surface of the pinna is important to us. So starting with the structures uh, of the pinna, the parts of it, the first thing we have to see here is the first, uh, the curved rim that you can see over here marked in purple here, this is known as the helix. So you can see this is where it is beginning, this is the crust of the helix and it goes, uh, curved, goes in around in a curved fashion. So this helix sometimes it can have a small prominence on its posterior superior aspect. So uh, sometimes we see that this helix there can be it can have a small prominence on a posterior superior aspect which is known as a Darwin's tubercle. But this is not present in every individual. Next comes the antihelix. Antihelix is that part which is anterior to and parallel to the helix. So you'll see here over here that this is the antihelix. So it is also a curved rim which is anterior to the helix and also parallel to it. And as you can see over here, it is superiorly the antihelix is dividing into two crura like this. And after dividing into the two crura, what it is enclosing between within itself, right over here, this part is known as the triangular fossa. And the scaphoid fossa is that part which lies above superior of the two crura, which is this particular region. So what happens is the antihelix, it is dividing into two crura, within which it is uh, enclosing the triangular fossa. And above the level of the two crura, is, uh, we have the scaphoid fossa. And then in front of the antihelix, also partly encircled by it, we see the concha. So this is the antihelix, so the part which is in front of it is this region. This region is known as the concha. Now concha itself, it can be divided into two portions, 
by the descending limb of the anterior superior portion of the helix also known as the crust of the helix. So, you see this whole region over here in front of the antihelix is the concha. So, the concha itself is getting divided by the crust of the helix right over here. So, you can see the smaller portion which is located above this, this region is the simple concha and it is direct lateral relation to the supramatal triangle of the temporal bone. As we will learn later the supramatal triangle is a very important part we have to be learning about to do any mastoid surgeries. And the lower, lower larger inferior portion as you can see over here this part is known as a cavum concha. So, the concha has been divided by the crust of the helix into two parts the superior smaller portion the simba concha and the larger inferior portion which is known as a cavum concha. Next, now below the crust of the helix and overlapping the external auditory canal we find a structure known as the tragus. Tragus is basically a small blunt triangular prominence which is lying uh, right over here pointing posteriorly. So, this structure you can see over here this is the tragus it is formed of cartilage it is a small blind, blunt tri triangular prominence which is pointing posteriorly and just opposite to the tragus lies the antitragus. Now, what is this antitragus? Antitragus is right over here. This is called the antitragus. As you can see, it is lying opposite to the tragus at the inferior limit of the antihelix. And after antitragus, what we need to know is the intertragic notch. So, the intertragic notch is this region which is separating the tragus from the antitragus. And lastly, we come to the lobule. This is the lobule right over here. Lobule is lies lying below the antitragus and it is soft being composed of fibrous and adipose tissue. So, the lobule is the only part of the pinna which is not formed of cartilage, rather it is formed of fibrous and adipose tissue. So, this completes all the structures that we needed to know about the lateral surface of the auricle. Now, coming to the medial surface also known as the cranial surface of the auricle, it also has got elevations which corresponds to the depressions of the lateral surface and they have uh, corresponding names for example, the eminentia concha. Now, when we are talking about the structure of pinna, so first the layer, first layer that we see is the skin of the pinna. The skin of the pinna is very thin and it is closely attached to the perichondrium on the lateral surface whereas it is slightly loose on the medial or the cranial surface. You can easily feel you can easily feel this by touching your own pinna. So if you were to touch the lateral side you will see that you will not be able to pinch the skin on the lateral surface of the pinna. Whereas, if you turn your pinna and touch on the posterior side which is the medial surface, you can see that you can easily pinch up the skin over here. Why, why, why is this really? This is because on the medial surface there is a subdermal adipose tissue and this tissue helps in allowing for dissection during pinnaplasty. So, this location of this tissue is what is making the skin loose on the medial surface. The skin of the auricle is covered with fine hair. You will see that not all people have hair coming out of their ears, but some people who do have it, you will see that this hair mostly comes from the conchal region and the scaphoid fossa. So, if you were to see a picture over here, you will see actually most people they have hair coming out of the conchal region from here or sometimes from the scaphoid fossa. These are the two regions that hair comes from the pinna. Other than hair, sebaceous glands they also open into the root canals of these hair. Thick coarse hair form over the tragus and the intertragic notch in middle and old aged males. Now, after skin what lies uh, the main structure of the pinna is formed by a cartilage. So, basically the body of the auricle is being formed by elastic fibrocartilage. It is forming the whole of the pinna except for one particular region which is the lobule. As I said the lobule is formed of adipose tissue. So, this cartilage of the pinna it extends 
into the extends medially to continue with the cartilage of the external auditory canal and helps in forming its lateral one third. So it forms a continuous plate except for in between the tragus and the anterior crust of helix where it is replaced by a dense fibrous tissue band known as incisura terminalis. So what I mean by this is the fact that that uh, the cartilage of the pinna is actually a continuous cartilage throughout except in this one particular region. So this is the spine of helix and this is the tragus. So the region in between the two, this region is known as the incisura terminalis. This is where the cartilage gets replaced by a dense fibrous tissue band. And this uh, particular fact has an importance. This is because, because there is no cartilage over here, this has been the site for end oral incision. When we approach the uh, when, when we approach our ear surgeries via the end oral approach, we give an incision in this region. Why is that? It's because it will not damage the cartilage or its perichondrium. Because there is no cartilage in this region, it's just a fibrous tissue band. And therefore, this is allowing a wide exposure of the deeper parts of the canal after splitting the soft tissue ring surrounding it. So this is the importance of incisura terminalis, with this is the site of end oral incision. And the cartilage in general, it is surrounded, it is covered by perichondrium. The importance of this perichondrium layer is that this is where the cartilage gets its blood supply from, because the cartilage itself is an avascular structure. It does not have a blood supply on its own, it gets its blood supply from the perichondrium. And this particular fact also has something uh, that is important clinically. Clinical importance of this particular fact is that when in any case of injuries, traumatic injuries, when there is a stripping of perichondrium from the cartilage, the cartilage ends up losing its blood supply. And as a result, what happens is there is a hematoma formation leading to a cartilage necrosis and ultimately formation of something which is known as boxes here. You can see in this picture over here, this is what we know as the boxes here. In any case of traumatic injury, the perichondrium gets teared off from the cartilage and therefore it loses all its uh, blood supply and this leads to the formation of boxes here. Other than this, there are a lot of other places where the pinna, the structures of the pinna have been useful in. The pinna has been the source of several graft materials for a surgeon cartilage from the tragus, the perichondrium from the tragus or the concha and fat of the lobule have been very frequently used for reconstructive surgery of the middle ear. And also the conchal cartilage, it has been used to correct a depressed nasal bridge whereas the composite grafts of the skin and cartilage from the pinna, they have sometimes been used in repairing the defects of nasal ala. So these are the importance the clinical, uh, clinically related importance of the pinna. Next, we move on to the ligaments of the pinna. So, there are uh, two kinds of ligaments. There are extrinsic ligaments and there are intrinsic ligaments. So the cartilage of the auricle is getting connected to the temporal bone by two extrinsic ligaments. One is an anterior ligament and one is a posterior ligament. The anterior ligament, it runs from the tragus and a cartilaginous spine on the crust of the helix and it goes anteriorly to the root of the zygomatic arch whereas the posterior ligament it runs from the medial surface of the concha to the lateral surface of the mastoid prominence posteriorly so this is these are the two extrinsic ligaments of the pinna the intrinsic ligaments on the other hand what it is responsible in doing is that it connects various parts of the cartilaginous auricle within itself Extrinsic was when it was uh, when it was connecting a structure of the uh, auricle or the pinna itself to some other structure outside, whereas the intrinsic is one which is connecting two parts of the auricle itself. So there is one in between the helix and the tragus, and another one in between the antihelix to the posterior inferior portion of the helix. So this is uh, all about the ligaments of uh, of the pinna. Next, we move on to the muscles. Now there are extrinsic muscles and intrinsic muscles. So first we'll talk about the extrinsic muscles. There are three extrinsic muscles. Uh, the auricularis anterior, as you can see in the picture over here, is the smallest muscle. It is thin and it has pale fibers. Next is the auricularis superior. 
This is the largest out of the three extrinsic muscles. It is very thin and as you can see from the shape over here, it is shaped in the form of a fan. And thirdly is the auricularis posterior. This as you can see over here, it has two or three fleshy fasciculi and it inserts to the ponticulus. Now all of these three extrinsic muscles, they radiate out from the auricle to insert into the epicranial aponeurosis. And these three muscles get its blood supply from the posterior auricular artery. The anterior and the superioris muscle, they get its nerve supply from the temporal branch of the facial nerve, whereas the auricularis posterior gets its supply from the posterior auricular, uh, posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve. Now, uh, if you talk about action, uh, the anterior auricularis anterior, it helps in the movement in the forward and upward direction. Auricularis superior elevates the pinna and auricularis posterior helps in a backward direction movement. Now these are the three extrinsic muscles. Next we come on to the intrinsic muscles of the pinna. These are the muscles which pa pass in between the cartilaginous parts of the auricle. There are six intrinsic muscles, the helices major, helices minor, tragicus, antitragicus, transversus auriculae and obliquus auriculae. Now these are not too important to know about, just to remember in broad in general that there are six uh, such intrinsic muscles. They are responsible for very minimal change in the shape of the auricle. They get its supply from the temporal and the posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve and its blood supply from the posterior auricular and superficial temporal artery. Next we come on to the blood supply of the pinna. It gets its blood supply mostly from the external carotid artery. Now what are the branches which is supplying? The dominant main artery in its supply is the posterior auricular artery. It is supplying the medial surface except for the lobule, the concha, the middle and lower portions of the helix and lower part of the anterior helix. So you can see over here this is the posterior auricular artery which is a branch of the external carotid artery. It is a main branch which is supplying the pinna. Other than this, uh, also the anterior auricular branches of the superficial temporal artery, it supplies the upper portion of the helix, antihelix, triangular fossa, the tragus and the lobule. These parts are supplied by the superficial temporal artery. Next, the superior auricular artery, it has a constant course and it connects the superficial temporal artery and the posterior art, uh, auricular artery network. And lastly, sometimes you'll see a small auricular branch from the occipital artery, which sometimes assist in the posterior uh, auricular artery in supplying the medial surface of the pinna. Next, we move on to the nerve supply. Now, nerve supply is very important to remember. This is a very commonly asked uh, in your viva questions. There are five nerve supplies over here. The first is the greater auricular nerve which is uh, a branch of the cervical plexus C2 and C3. This greater auricular nerve is responsible sup for supplying most of the medial surface, as you can see over here, the purple colored part and the posterior part of the lateral surface. Next is the lesser occipital, which is also a branch of the cervical plexus. It is responsible for supplying the superior portion of the medial surface. This portion in yellow over here is the part which is supplied by it. Next comes the auricular branch of the vagus. This nerve is responsible for supplying the concha and the antihelix and some parts of the medial surface which is the eminentia concha. Fourth branch is the auricular temporal branch which is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. This part is responsible in supplying the tragus, the crust of the helix and adjacent part of the helix and lastly is the facial nerve which supplies a very small region in the root of the concha. So these five nerves is something you have to remember, you have to remember which are the parts it is uh, supplying to. Next we move on to the lymphatic drainage. Now in lymphatic drainage uh, the, uh, from the posterior surface with, or the medial surface it mostly goes towards the post auricular lymph nodes which is located at the mastoid tip as you can see over here from the medial surface it goes to the posterior auricular nodes and uh, from the tragus an upper part of the anterior surface it goes to the pre auricular nodes and thirdly from the rest of the auricle it goes to the upper deep cervical nodes.
so these three are the lymphatic drainage of the pinna now this completes our topic on pinna next we move on to the second part of the external ear which is the external auditory canal now external auditory canal as a, uh, you can see from the picture its extent is from the concha on the lateral side to the tympanic membrane to the medial side so this whole portion over here is the external auditory canal its length is approximately 2.4 cm and uh, you can divide the external auditory canal into two parts outer one third which is the cartilaginous portion and inner two third which is the bony portion you can see over here this part outer one third is the cartilaginous part and the rest two third of it is the bony part and also the anterior wall and the floor they are actually 6 mm longer than the posterior wall and the roof of the ESC now when we talk about the direction of the ESC it is actually not a straight canal so it is s shaped actually now how does the shape form now as i said before it has a cartilaginous portion and a bony portion so the cartilaginous part is actually directed upwards backwards and medially whereas the bony portion is directed downwards forwards and medially so what happens is if you had to straighten the canal if you had to examine the ear if you had to look at the tympanic membrane you would have to have the canal straightened first so what we have to do here we have to gently move the auricle or the pinna upwards and backwards to counteract the direction of the cartilaginous portion so this is important to remember while we are doing an examination of the ear so this is in case of adults it neonates what different what is different is a fact that they actually do not have any bony external meters because the tympanic bone has not been developed yet and because of this reason the tympanic membrane is actually more horizontally placed so the auricle must be gently drawn downwards and backwards for the best view of the tympanic membrane so both these points are important to remember when we are clinically examining the ear in case of uh, children in case of neonates we have to pull the pinna downwards and backwards whereas in case of uh, adults we have to uh, pull the uh, pinna upwards and backwards now coming to the parts of the esc first we'll talk about the cartilaginous part now this cartilaginous part is the outer one third portion it is 8 mm long and it is continuous with the auricular cartilage you can see over here this is the cartilaginous portion and it is continuous with the cartilage of the aur auricle and also you'll see that the medial border of the cartilaginous portion it gets attached to the rim of the bony canal by with the help of some fibrous bands a very distinct feature of the cartilaginous part are these two horizontal fissures of santorini these fissures are actually present antero inferiorly in the cartilaginous portion you can see over here these are the uh, fissures of santorini now what is the importance clinical importance of this fissures of santorini it number one it helps in increasing the flexibility but it allows the pa passage of infection or tumor into the parotid gland and secondly there is one more importance of the cartilaginous part of the external auditory canal is that hair follicles are present only in this cartilaginous portion the bony part does not have any hair follicles therefore in any case of furuncles of the external auditory canal it will only be seen in this cartilaginous esc so these are the two important things clinically important in case of cartilaginous esc next we move on to the bony esc it is the in in a one two third of the external auditory canal 16 mm long the skin lining the bony canal is very thin and it is continuous over the tympanic membrane as i said you just now it is devoid of any skin appendages which is hair or any ceruminous glands and the medial end of the bony canal is marked by a groove which is known as the tympanic sulcus this tympanic sulcus is absent superiorly and that is something we'll be discussing while we discuss the tympanic membrane also in this bony region we find two suture lines in the canal wall the tympanosquamous suture anteriorly and the tympanomastoid suture posteriorly the importance of these suture line is that 
they project into the canal with overlying closely adherent skin which is why it becomes very difficult to raise an intact tympanometal flap so while we are raising the tympanometal flap and we are close to the suture lines we have to be extra careful while raising the flap now as i said about, about fissures of santorini being present in the cartilaginous portion there's something known as the foramen of husky which is present in the bony part this is basically the antero inferior part of the bony canal where a deficiency is present in children up to the age of 4 or sometimes even in adults and this foramen is responsible for permitting infection to and from the parotid So these are the two deficiencies we have to remember the fissures of Santorini in the cartilaginous part and the foramen of Husky in the bony part other than all of this there are two constrictions that we find in the external auditory canal one is seen at the junction of the cartilaginous and the bony parts and second is something called the isthmus isthmus is located 5 mm from the tympanic membrane where what happens is that the anterior canal wall reduces in its diameter the importance of this isthmus is that just deep to this isthmus meaning medially the antero inferior portion of the canal dips forwards forming a wedge shaped anterior recess between the tympanic membrane and the canal you can see in this picture over here the antero inferior portion of the canal has dipped inwards and uh, you can see that there is a recess formed right over here the importance of this is that th this recess can be a very difficult spot to assess either in clinics or in cases of surgeries so any accumulation any foreign body in this uh, region can be very easily missed coming to the relations of the external auditory canal as you already know uh, laterally it is connecting with the outside world medially lies the middle ear the medial boundary is the tympanic membrane posteriorly lies the mastoid anteriorly as you see over here this is anteriorly lies the tm joint the superficial temporal artery and vein auricular temporal nerve the parotid gland over here pre auricular lymph nodes superiorly over here lies the middle cranial fossa and inferiorly lies the jugular bulb carotid facial nerve styloid process parotid gland and the digastric muscle next we'll be talking about the lining epithelium the external canal is lined with keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium which lacks the retipegs and skin appendages in the thin skin of the bony canal Now there is something uh, very unique about the skin of the external auditory canal as when compared to the skin on the rest of the body. What is it? So the body skin normally grows directly from the basal layers towards the surface where it is shed into the surroundings. Now excess proliferation in the scalp trapped by the hair is what is known as dandruff. So this is a way of getting rid of the excessive proliferation that happens. Now if this same pattern of growth were to also occur in the external ear canal what would happen is that the canal will actually get filled with desquamated skin and get obliterated so in an order to avoid this the skin of the external auditory canal has a very different property so instead of the maturation taking place directly towards the surface there is actually an outward oblique growth of the epidermis of the canal skin So if this were to be the canal the skin actually has a outward oblique growth so as a result of which what happens the surface layer effectively migrate towards the external opening of the canal instead of getting accumulated inside the canal and the normal rate of migration of this is about 0.1 mm per day now there is an importance why uh, why is this particular a uh, property important for us it's because in some conditions we have seen that there will be a complete failure of migration with a consequent build up of shed keratin in the ear canal a lot of people have this and this is seen in patients who are prone to cerumen impaction they have a keratin keratinocyte attachment destroying substance cats 
because we have seen that much longer sheets of desquamated keratin which are in continuity with the stratum corneum. We have seen this particular feature in these patients. Now other than this, at the outer limits of the ear canal, we see some short hair that project towards the opening of the canal and these hair are oriented with the tips laterally. Next we move on to what other structures are present here. Uh, in the skin covering the cartilaginous canal, it has some appendages like the ceruminous glands and the pilosebaceous glands. The ceruminous glands are actually modified sweat glands which secrete cerumen and the pilosebaceous gland they, uh, produce an oily material known as the sebum. Now uh, all of this leads to the formation of wax inside our ear. So what is wax exactly? It is a mixture of desquamated cells, cerumen and sebum. And we have seen that there are two varieties of wax which is seen, a dry variety and a wet variety. The dry wax is usually yellowish or grey in colour, it is dry and the wet wax is yellowish brown, wet and sticky. And importance of the wax is that it contains amino acids, fatty acids, lysozymes, immunoglobulins and it has some bactericidal activity. Next we move on to the blood supply of external auditory canal. It is uh, the arterial supply is also derived from uh, the external carotid artery just like the pinna. So the main arteries here are the auricular branches of the superficial temporal artery which supplies the roof and anterior part of the canal. The deep auricular branch of the first part of maxillary artery, it uh, is supplying the anterior meatal wall skin and the epithelium of the outer surface of the tympanic membrane. And thirdly, the auricular branches of the posterior auricular artery which supplies the posterior part of the canal. And in terms of veins, all the veins they drain into the external jugular vein, the maxillary veins and the pterygoid plexus. Next we move on to the nerve supply. Uh, when we talk about nerve supply, it has three particular nerve supply. First is the auriculotemporal nerve over here which supplies the anterior wall and the roof of the external auditory canal. Th uh, second is auricular branch of vagus which is uh, right over here. It is help, uh, helping in supplying the posterior wall and the floor. Whereas a small portion in the posterior wall of the auditory canal receives its supply from the facial nerve through the auricular branch of vagus. This particular supply holds a great value in a clinical scenario which is something known as the Hitzelberger sign. Hitzelberger sign is seen in patients with acoustic neuroma. Now, what is this sign? What happens here is that there is hypoastasia of a posterior meatal wall which occurs due to pressure on the facial nerve. So as I told you right now that some part in the posterior meatal wall is supplied by the facial nerve, this region experiences some hypoastasia in patients with acoustic neuroma. A second importance uh, of the nerve supply in the external auditory canal is the vasovagal reflex. Very commonly while we clean the ESE, patients supply sometime, sometimes develop coughing, bradycardia, syncope and sometimes even cardiac arrest. This happens because of the Arnold's branch of vagus nerve. Also third, because of the vagal innovation here, instilling spirit in ESE before a meal can stimulate somebody's appetite. And lastly is a Ramsey Hunt syndrome. The vesicles of herpes zoster oticus occurs on the mastoid and the posterior meatal wall which indicates that this part of the external ear has a facial nerve innervation. So all of these four are very important clinical points you need to remember in relation to the nerve supply of the ESE. So that completes our topic on uh, ESE and the pinna today. So the pinna and the external auditory canal, they are both parts of the external ear. Now the next topic we have to talk about is the partition in between the external ear and the middle ear, which is the tympanic membrane. I'll be covering that in my next video. So guys, stay tuned with me and I'll be catching you in my next video with the anatomy of the tympanic membrane.